British rule. Planters, buccaneers, and slaves. In 1655 a British expedition, under Admiral Sir William Penn, and General Robert Venables captured Jamaica, and began expelling the Spanish, a task that was accomplished within five years. However, many of the Spaniards' escaped slaves had formed communities in the highlands, and increasing numbers also escaped from British plantations. The former slaves were called Maroons, a name probably derived from the Spanish word Cimarron, meaning wild or untamed. The Maroons adapted to life in the wilderness by establishing remote defensible settlements, cultivating scattered plots of land, notably with plantains and yams, hunting, and developing herbal medicines. Some also intermarried with the few remaining Taino. A slave's life on Jamaica was brutal and short, because of high incidences of tropical and imported diseases and harsh working conditions, the number of slave deaths was consistently larger than the number of births. Europeans fared much better, but were also susceptible to tropical diseases, such as yellow fever and malaria. Despite those conditions, slave traffic and European immigration increased, and the island's population grew from a few thousand in the mid-17th century to about 18,000 in the 1680s, with slaves accounting for more than half of the total. The British military governor, concerned about the possibility of Spanish assaults, urged buccaneers to move to Jamaica, and the island's ports soon became their safe havens, Port Royal, in particular, gained notoriety for its great wealth and lawlessness. The buccaneers relentlessly attacked Spanish Caribbean cities and commerce, thereby strategically aiding Britain by diverting Spain's military resources and threatening its lucrative gold and silver trade. Some of the buccaneers held royal commissions as privateers, but were still largely pirates, nevertheless, many became part-time merchants or planters. After the Spanish recognized British claims to Jamaica in the Treaty of Madrid, 1670, British authorities began to suppress the buccaneers. In 1672, they arrested Henry Morgan following his successful, though unsanctioned, assault on Panama. However, two years later the Crown knighted him and appointed him Deputy Governor of Jamaica, and many of his former comrades submitted to his authority. The Royal African Company was formed in 1672 with a monopoly of the British slave trade, and from that time Jamaica became one of the world's busiest slave markets, with a thriving smuggling trade to Spanish America. African slaves soon outnumbered Europeans five to one. Jamaica also became one of Britain's most valuable colonies in terms of agricultural production, with dozens of processing centers for sugar, indigo, and cacao, the source of cocoa beans. Although a plant disease destroyed much of the cacao crop in 1670 to 71. European colonists formed a local legislature as an early step toward self-government, although its members represented only a small fraction of the wealthy elite. From 1678, the British appointed governor instituted a controversial plan to impose taxes and abolish the assembly, but the legislature was restored in 1682. The following year the assembly acquiesced in passing a revenue act. In 1692 an earthquake devastated the town of Port Royal, destroying and inundating most of its buildings. Survivors of the disaster established Kingston across the bay. Exports and internal strife Port Royal and Kingston Harbour Jamaican sugar production reached its apogee in the 18th century, dominating the local economy and depending increasingly on the slave trade as a source of cheap labor. Several of the major plantation owners lived in England and entrusted their operations to major domos, whereas small landowners struggled to make profits in the face of higher production costs. Many of the latter group diversified into coffee, cotton, and indigo production, and by the late 18th century coffee rivaled sugar as an export crop. Meanwhile Jamaica's slave population swelled to 300,000, despite mounting civil unrest, the menace of invasion from France and Spain, 
and unstable food supplies, notably during the period 1780-87, when about 15,000 slaves starved to death. Maroons intermittently used guerrilla tactics against Jamaican militia and British troops, who had destroyed many Maroon settlements in 1686. Two of the bloodiest periods in the 18th century became known as the Maroon Wars. Following the first such conflict, 1725-39, Edward Trelawney, the island's governor, granted freedom to the followers of the Maroon warrior Cujo and relinquished control over part of the interior. British forces decisively won the Second War, 1795-97, which they waged relentlessly, burning towns and destroying field crops in their wake. After the fighting ceased, the government deported some 600 Maroons to Nova Scotia. In addition, slave revolts occurred in the 18th and early 19th centuries, particularly in 1831-32, when black leaders such as Samuel Sharp stirred up thousands of followers, however, British troops quickly put down the rebellion and executed its organizers. Whites generally blamed missionaries, who were working among the slaves, for inciting the revolt, and in the weeks that followed, mobs gathered by the Colonial Church Union, an organization of white planters loyal to the Anglican Church, burned several Baptist and Methodist chapels. Jamaica's internal strife was accompanied by external threats. A large French fleet, with Spanish support, planned to invade Jamaica in 1782, but the British admirals George Rodney and Samuel had thwarted the plan at the Battle of the Saints off Dominica. In 1806 Admiral Sir John Duckworth defeated the last French invasion force to threaten the island. The British Parliament abolished the transatlantic slave trade in 1807, which increased planters' costs in Jamaica at a time when the price of sugar was already dropping. Parliament subsequently approved an Emancipatory Act that gave all enslaved people in British colonies their freedom by 1838. Many former slaves left the plantations and moved to the nearby hills, where their descendants still farm small land holdings. The planters received some compensation, £19 per slave, but generally saw their financial resources and labor forces dwindle. Parliament removed protective tariffs in 1846, further reducing the price of Jamaican sugar. Charles T. Metcalf The royal governor, the Jamaican legislature, and Parliament had many bitter disagreements regarding taxation and government expenditures. In the late 1830s and 40s the governors Sir Charles T. Metcalf and James Bruce, 8th Earl of Elgin, attempted to improve the economy by bringing in thousands of plantation workers from India, rather than paying higher wages to former slaves, and creating the island's first railway. In spite of those programs, the plantation system collapsed, leading to widespread poverty and unemployment. In 1865 impoverished former slaves rioted in the town of Morant Bay, killing the chief magistrate and 18 others of European ancestry. The Jamaican Assembly, dismayed, ceded its power to Governor Edward John Eyre, who declared martial law, suppressed the rioters, and hanged the principal instigator, Paul Bogle, and his alleged co-conspirator, Assembly member. George William Gordon. Many West Indians applauded his actions, but amid public outcries and an official investigation in Britain he was recalled and dismissed from his position. The Crown Colony. The Jamaican Assembly had effectively voted its own extinction by yielding power to air, and in 1866 Parliament declared the island a Crown Colony. Its newly appointed governor, Sir John Peter Grant, wielded the only real executive or legislative power. He completely reorganized the colony, establishing a police force, reformed judicial system, medical service, public works department, and government savings bank. He also appointed local magistrates, improved the schools, and irrigated the fertile, 
but drought-stricken plain between Spanish Town and Kingston. The British restored representative government by degrees, allowing nine elected legislators in 1884 and 14 in 1895. The economy no longer depended on sugar exports by the latter part of the 19th century, when Captain Lorenzo Dow Baker, founder of the organization that later became the United Fruit Company, started a lucrative banana trade in Jamaica. Bananas soon became a principal export crop for small farmers, as well as for large estates. In 1907 a violent earthquake and accompanying fire struck Kingston and Port Royal, destroying or seriously damaging almost all of their buildings and killing about 800 people. Kingston's layout and architecture were subsequently altered, and Sir Sidney Olivier, later Lord Olivier, rebuilt its public offices on the finest street of the city. The economy recovered slowly from the disaster, and unemployment remained a problem. In the early 20th century thousands of Jamaicans migrated to help build the Panama Canal, or to work on Cuban sugar plantations. From the 1920s the growing professional classes and people of mixed African and European ancestry agitated for more representative government. The Universal Negro Improvement Association, founded in 1914 by Jamaican Marcus Garvey, advocated black nationalism and pan-Africanism in Jamaica and among the African diaspora. Dissatisfaction with the Crown Colony system sharpened by the hardships of the Great Depression of the 1930s, erupted in widespread rioting in 1938. Jamaicans responded to the crisis by establishing their first labor unions, linking them to political parties, and increasingly demanding self-determination. Self-Government of Jamaica The Con Constitution of 1944 established a House of Representatives, whose members were elected by universal adult suffrage. It also called for a nominated legislative council as an upper house, with limited powers, and an executive council. A two-party pattern soon emerged, and the constitution was modified in 1953 to allow for elected government ministers. In 1957 the executive council was transformed into a cabinet under the chairmanship of a premier. Jamaica obtained full internal self-government two years later. Jamaica was little affected by World Wars I and II, though many of its people served overseas in the British Armed Forces. After World War II the island profited greatly from the Colonial Development and Welfare Act and from outside investment. Colonial Development grants financed the building of the Jamaican branch of the University of the West Indies, established 1948, which became an important factor in the preparation for independence. A sugar refinery, citrus processing plants, a cement factory, and other industrial projects were started. A severe hurricane in August 1951 temporarily stalled development by devastating crops and killing about 150 people. The development of the tourist trade in bauxite, aluminum ore, Mining helped increase employment opportunities on the island. In 1958 Jamaica became a founding member of the West Indies Federation, a group of Caribbean islands that formed a unit within the Commonwealth. Norman Manley, leader of the People's National Party PNP, became Premier after the elections of July 1959, but in 1960 the Jamaica Labour Party JLP, under Sir Alexander Bustamante pressed for secession from the Federation. A referendum in 1961 supported their views. The JLP was the overall winner of elections in April 1962, and Bustamante became Premier. In May the Federation was dissolved. The Independent Country On August 6, 1962, Jamaica became independent with full dominion status within the Commonwealth, under a constitution that retained the British monarch as head of state. Bustamante assumed the title of Prime Minister. 
The following year Jamaica joined the International Monetary Fund, IMF. Bustamante was succeeded in February 1967 by Donald Sangster, who died within about a month of leading the JLP to victory in the elections. Hugh Lawson Shearer, a protégé of Bustamante, succeeded Sangster and served from 1967 to 1972. From 1962 to 1972 there were important developments in infrastructure and in technical, vocational and teacher education. Cultural policy promoted Jamaica's cultural heritage. In 1964 Marcus Garvey was officially declared a national hero, followed by George William Gordon and Paul Bogle in 1965. National honours replaced British honours in 1969. The Cold War strongly influenced Jamaica's relations with the United States, which was Jamaica's major trading partner and the primary investor in bauxite and tourism. Britain continued to offer a protected market for sugar and banana exports. Jamaica established a formal relationship with communist Cuba, but it remained cold. In June 1969 Jamaica became the 24th member of the Organization of American States. That same year it also joined the non-aligned movement, established closer relations with a number of African countries, and supported anti-apartheid initiatives. Investments in tourism, bauxite, and capital-intensive light manufacturing industries fueled economic growth, however, the expanding economy failed to absorb the growing workforce. The bulldozing of squatter communities in West Kingston, and the recruitment by both political parties of elements, including criminal elements, of the inner city to fight their political wars increased disaffection and violence in urban communities. In 1967 the government imposed a state of emergency in West Kingston. In 1972 the PNP won its first major electoral victory since independence, and it chose Michael Manley, the charismatic son of Norman Manley, as Prime Minister. Manley reasserted the PNP's democratic socialist ideological foundations through efforts to increase literacy, access to higher education, and home ownership, and removed laws that discriminated against women and against children born out of wedlock. In contrast to the policies of the JLP prime ministers who preceded him, he improved relations with socialist and communist countries such as Cuba, China, and the Soviet Union, endorsed anti-colonial rebellions in southern Africa, and deepened ties with the non-aligned movement. He also imposed a bauxite levi. Attacks on Manley's policies as communist were accompanied by violence, leading to the declaration of a state of emergency in 1976. Nevertheless, the government's social policies were popular among voters, ensuring electoral victory for Manley and the PNP in the 1976 elections. To cope with the oil shocks of the 1970s, the regime signed an accord with Venezuela and Mexico to obtain oil at concessionary rates. Yet, worsening social and economic conditions, increased political violence, and deteriorating relations with the United States brought about Manley's defeat in the elections of 1980 by the Edward Siegel-led JLP. With the intention of bringing about a reconciliation with the United States, Seeger severed relations with Cuba. The response of US President Ronald Reagan's administration to Seeger's anti-communist policies was positive, Jamaica became a major recipient of US aid in the Caribbean and also benefited from Reagan's Caribbean Basin Initiative a regional economic recovery plan. In October 1983 Seeger sent troops to support a US Caribbean military initiative to topple the leftist regime in Grenada. That move temporarily lifted the Seeger regime's popularity, which had declined in the face of an international recession, and Seeger called for early elections to be held in December. The PNP boycotted the polls over a disagreement regarding election procedures, and thus all seats in the House of Representatives, as well as the Prime Ministership, went to the JLP. 
The austerity imposed by the restructuring requirements of the World Bank and IMF sparked riots and a general strike. In 1985, in spite of continued growth in tourism and more optimistic trends in the international economy after 1986, the JLP lost the February 1989 elections to the PNP and Manley was returned to office as Prime Minister. David J. Buisseret James A. Ferguson Patrick Bryan Manley adopted more conservative policies during his second term. He cooperated closely with the IMF, deregulated the financial sector, and floated the Jamaican dollar. He retired in March 1992 and was replaced by P.J. Patterson, who stabilized the economy through austerity measures. During the 1990s the PNP retained power, partly because the JLP split in 1995, creating a third party, the National Democratic Movement. The start of disengagement by the political parties from gang leaders and the establishment of the Electoral Commission contributed significantly to a decrease in political violence. Patterson's administration focused on construction of arterial roads, land distribution and housing solutions, and working with the Caribbean Common Market, later Caribbean Community Caricom, and Caribbean Court of Justice. The administration faced a serious financial crisis in 1997, and the national debt continued to be challenging. However, the continuing strain of rising oil prices and declining bauxite revenues was partly offset by significant Spanish investments in hotels after 2000. Following Patterson's retirement, Portia Simpson Miller was elected president of the PNP and became prime minister, the first woman to serve in the country's top post as well as the first woman to lead the party. From January 2006 Jamaica was a part of the Caribbean single market and economy, established by revisions to the 1973 Treaty of Chagaramas. The treaty, which led to the creation of CARICOM, had been revised in 2002 to remove barriers to free trade and the free movement of capital and people within the region. The 18-year PNP regime ended with the JLP's narrow victory in the general elections of 2007 and Bruce Golding replaced Simpson Miller as Prime Minister. Golding's administration, 2007-11, coincided with another international economic recession. The government entered a new agreement with the IMF, divested struggling government-owned sugar estates to a Chinese company, and sold the economically unviable Air Jamaica to Trinidad and Tobago. During that period Russian investors made a substantial financial commitment to the bauxite industry. Systematic efforts also were made to develop agriculture. Moreover, Falmouth Harbour was deepened to attract the largest cruise ships and opened to them in 2011. In 2010 Golding's handling of the US demand for the extradition of Christopher Dudas Koch, a powerful leader within Golding's constituency, for drug trafficking proved politically controversial. Koch's attempt to keep security forces from seizing and extraditing him led to a military and police incursion into Koch's stronghold in the Tivoli Gardens community of Kingston in May 2010. Several dozen people died as a result, and Golding resigned following an official inquiry into the episode. His successor, Andrew Holness, was defeated in December 2011 elections by Portia Simpson Miller, who once again took office as Prime Minister. Patrick Bryan JLP won the February 25, 2016, elections, and Holness was sworn in for his second term early in March. In August, at the Rio de Janeiro 2016 Olympic Games, Jamaica's most iconic sports figure and the greatest sprinter in Olympic history, Usain Bolt, won the gold medal in the 100m and 200m dash, becoming the first man to win both of those races in three consecutive Olympics. Olympics 
the editors of Encyclopedia Britannica.